Hello, and thank you for joining us. I am April Rank, the Executive Director of the Arlington International Film Festival. And with me are the filmmakers, Marsha Jarmel and Ken Schneider of Los Hermanos, winner of the AIFF Best Documentary Award uh, in 2021. Welcome, Marsha and Ken. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, April. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. So Ken and Marsha, I'm, I'm curious before we dive into the film itself, but what your connections are to Cuba. And maybe Ken, we'll start with you first because I do know just this much that um, I read that your father um, had fled Nazi Europe and was uh, not able or was turned away here in Europe and was admitted uh, as a refugee to Cuba. So carry on. <laughs> well, you know, April, there's a, there's a lot of stories on the island. Ours is but one of them, but, but uh, American history, many American histories do pass through Cuba, and, and you pretty much got it. My father, grandma, and great-grandma were forced to flee Nazi-occupied Austria in 1941, and when they, the, the, the boat they were able to get a ticket for stopped in Cuba, in Havana, Cuba, and they landed there December 1st, 1941. And if you know your history, you'll mm -hmm. recognize that date. That was six days prior to Pearl Harbor. Once Pearl Harbor was bombed, FDR, who did a lot of great things, did not really open the doors to refugees. So dad, grandma, and great grandma lived in Cuba for a few years until the US uh, eased its immigration restrictions. And then they came to New York. But our family story did pass through Havana and at our breakfast table and dinner table, um, dad talked about that and uh, you know, I grew up as a, um, a, a Spanish speaker and a lover of baseball, and those things really intersect with Cuba and a lover of music. So I have various, you know, familial and personal intersections with Cuba and Cuban history and Cuban culture. Mm -hmm. And Marsha, what was your connection to Cuba? Yeah, so um, uh, we are... Uh, we made a film that was kind of in part about this story, a story of Ken's family um, that brought us to Cuba initially. Um, as, and uh, when that film toured uh, Cuba, uh, sorry, when, when, uh, we had an opportunity to meet a lot of people in the art space. We were on this fantastic bus with, with mm. uh, photographers and musicians and uh, uh, creative thinkers of various sorts for two weeks traveling around the, the island. And uh, it really got us very interested in, uh, in uh, doing something about uh, the arts in, in Cuba. And we made two short films besides that first feature, which was kind of the family story. And then, well, then Ken had an amazing experience at the uh, Havana Jazz Festival. Uh -huh. I see. Yeah. So that's what set all this. That, that's what got us on this particular train. Yeah. Mm. Well, I I've watched the film several times mm. and um, it brings me to tears. It's so beautiful. Mm. It's uh, you know, it's not, you know, obviously not just about music or family, um, but politics is so gently um, revealed in the background through the music and, and uh, family. It's, you're like lyrical musicians yourselves, how you do this. It's like, mm. you start out with no script, of course, because it's a documentary, right? But how did you decide the direction that you were gonna take with this film? Well, in April, you, you pretty much nailed it. You know, what drew us to the film, there's more storytelling here, but briefly, the, the idea that these two brothers were able to tour together in the US for the first time ever, and really be together and play together in a creative way for the first time since they were age 14 and eight, which is when Ilmar, the older violinist brother, left to study in Soviet Union and never really returned. So when President Obama eased those restrictions and allowed for that kind of travel, Marsha and I looked at each other and said, okay, you know, it's not a concert movie, it's a family story against the canvas of geopolitics. You, you couldn't write it any better, which is the beauty of documentary. Like you said, you know, when you find a story, you kind of get on the train and you have faith that cool things will happen. And fortunately, the, the, the two men we put in front of the camera were wonderful on screen. 
and uh, and wonderful things did happen. Some of them you identify, you know, at the emotional heart level, and also uh, a little bit at the political level. And even though we say we're not political filmmakers, there's certainly a backdrop against which the family story plays out. And, and because mm -hmm. they were on a tour initially, I mean, we thought we were just going to make a, kind of a road movie where we're going to see. Uh, uh, the U.S. through Cuban eyes, through all those eyes, and music was going to be the vehicle. But of course, mm -hmm. as stories do, it kind of went on. And, and then the trick became, well, how are we going to end the film? Because the story continues. You know, there was Trump and now there's Biden. I don't know. But uh, wow. we, we knew when they, they had that moment to record music together that that was going to be the end of the film. Mm -hmm. A goal that they had that was reached. Yeah, yeah. It so nice. it has a kind of uh, natural story arc. And, you know, there a lot of these stories, they don't end when, uh, you know, when the curtain, you know, rises on the film. They're, they're still having to deal with visa restrictions mm -hmm. and travel restrictions. So, you know, much of the story that, that you saw is still taking place. But of course, during that four years of President Trump, it was a particularly difficult time for cultural and commercial, any sort of exchange between our two countries, even between families. And, mm -hmm. and we started the filming during the Obama era where there was a, a brief moment of hope. We filmed through the Trump era mm -hmm. where that, that door of hope was slammed shut. And that was um, terrible for the world, but it did give a dramatic arc to the story of the two brothers who really wanted to create together and to you know love each other in a way that all siblings should. Yes. So how was it that you came to know the uh, Lopez uh, Galvian, Gal Gavilan, Gavilan. Gavilan yeah. family? Uh -huh. um, well, it, you know, as Marcia said, I was I was there presenting our first feature length film on Cuba and uh, at the Havana Film Fest, which slightly overlapped with Havana Jazz Fest. So I had some Cuban friends who said, hey, you, you know, you've got to go see this, this pianist play. He's great. And when you're Cuban friends, you've got to see, say you've got to see music, you know, you, you just sort of uh, drop everything and say, you know, where do I sign? You know, which, give me the time and the place. <laughs> and, uh, and then I saw this kind of 30 something wild haired pianist who played and, you know, Marsha and I, we're, we're music people, we love music. You know, we have, you know, we have music in our house and uh, I'd never experienced music like all those, that sort of mix of, you know, of, of, of classical, of jazz, of Afro-Cuban, of the deep, deeply joyful playing, plus mm -hmm. his original compositions. And that's when I came home to Marsha and said, you know, we gotta, we gotta turn the camera on this guy. It's amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was through the jazz festival, yes. It's really through the, through the music, through the right? Music. You know, uh -huh. once we got hooked on the music, it's like, well, let's see if there's a story there. The mu uh -huh. music was my my gateway drug into this story. <laughs> yes, no no doubt at all. I can understand. Um, I was uh, I was I, you really set the mood. I thought from the beginning when um, Ilmar goes into the violin shop and the weather's just turned slightly. So he has the privilege of like going to the violinist uh, or the violin shop and having it checked out. And then it switches uh, to Aldo talking about how right before a concert, he has to be the light man, the, the, the sweep the floors, you name it, in order to get ready for the concert. What a contrast that was. Uh, that Was that uh, another found um, uh, moment there to well, connect those stories? Well, there, there, there are a lot of serendipitous things that, that happen uh, in the course. I mean, things you really want to happen don't, and then things you don't expect are fantastic. <laughs> And the fact that it was snowing when we filmed Ilmar going to the violin shop couldn't have been better visually um, uh, for telling that story and, and making that contrast. You know, you go from kind of, you know, the hot Cuban universe into the, the snowstorm. Yeah. Another thing I should mention, April, is that um, one thing that really interests Marsh and I more than, say, polemics are uh, is nuance, you mm. know, and and people ask us, well, what's the tension in this when we were telling them about the film? Because the, the film that people think they want to see about Cuba is, you know, people get, risking their lives to get on boats in shark-infested waters and go to Miami, or, or two family members who, whenever they get together, sparks fly and they're ready to kill each other. That's not what we found, you know, with Aldo and Ilmar, um, they, 
each love their home countries. They each love the other's country and they love each other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the, the, the tension is sort of between that and the world that they have to live in where it's so hard for them to be together. So there's much more nuance than we, than we think. And yes, it is, you're absolutely right. It's easy for Ilmar to find a luthier in Fort Lee, New Jersey or any town <laughs> in America. And, uh, and Aldo you know, says there's, there's only you know, two or three good pianos on the whole island. Every community right. college in America that has a music department has a, you know, a seven foot in tune piano. So yes, mm. there's, there's stark differences. You don't have to look too hard to find them. <laughs> on the other hand, Aldo is surrounded by you know, musicians and visual artists and, and, and choreographers who work together and inspire each other and they're unburdened by the sort of needing to survive in the commercial sphere because that just, that's not the reality of life in Cuba. So mm -hmm. much more nuanced than we think. Mm -hmm. I, I love um, when uh, the father is uh, starting out with his concert and he talks about what art means to him as a person that lived through the revolution. And I just, and I just love that part where he, he says um, that we believe that art is critical to the development of the whole person. And it's interesting because we may believe that here in the US, but because of free enterprise, it's like art is not a part of the whole person's development in the US. And unless you have money to go for tickets to the symphony or uh, to the ICA in the Met, um, you, are, you don't have that same, um, that same accessibility for art to feed your soul. So did you feel that also, um, especially Ken, you the music person, when you were in uh, Cuba, did you feel that there was like just a vast, the vast um, majority of the populace that can experience the joys of the art that's produced? We think of, uh, of Cuba and the U.S. as kind of uh, countries inverted, like the stuff that works really well here doesn't work there and vice versa. Um, and art is, is everywhere. And uh, I mean, every, music is like it's there's a pulse in the streets and you can go to the symphony or the ballet or whatever for the price of a soda. It's very mm -hmm. accessible. I mean, not yeah. if you're in the provinces, it's not around you. Uh, there's music around you and dance around you for sure, but uh, but you know th that kind of culture exists uh, pretty much in the big cities, but it's completely accessible. That's mm -hmm. one of the the great pleasures. Um, not to mention that that the education that makes it possible to be those artists is uh, accessible to anyone with a talent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's yeah. actually it's part of the national project of of Cuba, and there were. Early in their development, there's there's more complicated histories there. Uh, you know what happened in the early '60s, and not what's happening today. But today, or in the past ten years, since Marsh and I have been there, we've seen some of the best music, um, and we've worked with some of the best film crews. Our cinematographer down there is is you know he's grade A among the best we've ever worked with. So there's there's tremendous talent there. You know, to be an artist is is not something that um, people roll their eyes at. You know, it is, it's a noble profession. When you graduate from art school, the government gives you sort of a three-year stipend to get yourself established, you know, as a painter or a sculptor or whatever. Um, mm. So you're not, you know, you, know you, you might be hungry, but you won't necessarily, you know, <laughs> you won't have to wait tables to, <laughs> to survive those three years. So it's a different relationship to the arts down there. And that is one of the things that, that kept us coming back. I've made 15 trips. Marsh has probably been there 10 times over the past 10 years. We had the yes. opportunity to teach there. So we were there, we've been there for months on end. Ah, so, yeah. yeah, lovely. Yeah. I thought it was interesting when, um, when Aldo uh, entered uh, the house uh, of Ilmar for the first time and he's, he, they come in through the basement and he thinks that's the apartment, I guess. I would, I would think so if I had a small apartment. And then it's, no, this is just the basement. Um, I thought it was interesting when they were sharing these very sensitive, um, spontaneous conversations that you could see, um, you know, that Aldo, when he was visiting here, was definitely taking it all in, um, so much more stuff to have, and, um, and how vast the infrastructure is and all of this business, but it didn't seem like he had a longing 
for things to be different in his life. Is that a sense that you you had from him when when you were with him? Well, I mean, my answer to that, April, is how, how much time you got? <laughs> you a know, little bit. <laughs> there are, I mean, there are some harsh realities. You know, it's difficult in socialist countries to feed their population. Um, they don't have the sort of, you know, partners of Eastern Europe anymore like they did in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, uh, when Aldo comes to States, he's really happy when he's on tour. He's happy to go to restaurants and, and you know, eat big, whether it's Hard Rock Cafe or a three egg omelet for breakfast. So for sure, you know, there's the daily life in Cuba is a bit of a grind. And they're, you know, middle class, they're doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, there's 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 much nuance uh, mm -hmm. around around food, and when it comes to access to medical care, they're way ahead of the curve. When right. it comes to access to food, you know, I think um, a middle class American is in better shape. So we can mm -hmm. kind of go through issue by issue by issue, and there are, you know, in some places there's remarkable similarities, and in some there's there's differences. Does Aldo aspire to have what he doesn't have? I don't think so. To be honest, he, he does pretty well because, you know, again, since the Obama time, he's been able to travel. And in Cuba, mm -hmm. if you perform abroad, if you teach dance lessons to tourists, if you can bring euros or dollars into your into your household, you can kind of jump into a different class. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think for him, if he gets to play a great piano in a nice ah. hall, he's really happy. Um, I'm sure he, you know, the, he wishes things were easier for people in his country, and um, you know they they're not uh, oblivious to mm -hmm. you know, how hard some things are. But I think Aldo was also, you know, it, when he in the states he lives in the world of classical music, so mm -hmm. he's in beautiful buildings with very well-to-do patrons, and he's taken out for nice meals. He was very surprised about Detroit, and not that Detroit mm -hmm. is the only place like that. I mean, every city has that. But they don't see that. They don't know that that, that, that there's that kind of poverty. And, and one thing in, um, in Cuba that's interesting is people are, are quite poor. Most people are very poor, but they're, people live someplace. I they're was about to say, community. they have they, a roof over their head. They're not homeless. And, they, and people you know, will help each other. And there is maybe not enough food, but everyone has some food. So there's, I mean, it's just, it's a different equation. And it's, a, as an American spending time there, someone from the US, it's just really, it's very provocative. It really makes you think about what we have and what we don't have here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how we feel about that. Whether we feel like we're really missing out on something if we don't achieve a certain level and we have enough stuff or as much as somebody else that we're looking at. It's, um. It's hard, I think, even for um, people born in the United States um, that are not materialistic um, to, to settle with that in our country. I know it has been a little tough for me. Mm -hmm. And, and um, travel to a place like Cuba, it's, it's a provocation. Mm -hmm. You know, everything, mm -hmm. like Marcia said, it's America on its head. So, you know, everyone there gets a, or most people there get a government salary. It's very modest. It's not really enough to live on. Um, so a lot of people have, you know, uh, basically a side hustle. Um, mm -hmm. they, might, they might buy and sell stuff at the street level. You know, they might, like I say, teach dance lessons or if they have that skill or, or art lessons or try to give tourists tour guides if they have a little English. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not, it's neither island paradise nor island hell. That's what we found mm -hmm. after our many trips there. Mm -hmm. So again, just to kind of... Um, clarify we were looking at a middle class family in Cuba that um, were musicians for several generations that have done fairly well. Yeah so so their dad Guido um, who you, you see is a conductor of some and a musician of some note um, in in Cuba and he actually I think was the started the music program at the um, at the National Art Uni uh, University. So I think, you know, he's sort of in whatever kind of hierarchy there is in the government, he, he has a, a spot of, of privilege. Um, mm -hmm. So they have a, a very lovely apartment. Maybe not everything works there, but it's really right across from the ocean and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And they the all live there, though, three generations in that in same the family. apartment. Ah, uh, how interesting. Is that typical in Cuba? The generations living Housing is hard. I think so. <laughs> I think people don't move out until they, you know, get married or if they move to a different city for work. Mm hmm they have mm -hmm. family sometimes, but, but you know, it's all—it's also very family-centered culture. You know, it's both Latinx, it's Caribbean, um, it's a very, very you know tight family structure. Is there anything that you um, encountered uh, during the filming that you would like to talk about that uh, that we've not discussed? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, you it's know, your baby, you know. Yeah, I, I well, there's there's <laughs> lots to talk about, but go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll mention something. It'll be a, really a handoff to the work Marsha's doing with the film. Um, I've always been interested in what happens with Cuba around race. Um, we I've been there many times, as I said, and my experience just from observing is, you know, on the level of the street, um, I never feel the kind of racism that, it seems to afflict our own country, you know, just dancing in a club or, you know, kind of, you know, bustling your way onto a, onto a bus or a van for transport, um, you know, being in a club. Uh, it feels like the, it doesn't have that, that harsh vibe that, um, that we haven't quite graduated from here in the States. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that means racism is absent but it's part of the national project again, that when they had the revolution in 59, that they actually criminalized discrimination of any sort. So there were segregated sites, you know, dance halls and whatnot, and that was all undone. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when we compare that to here, and you know, we, we, we hang out with, we film, we record these wonderful orchestras, very high level, you know, string orchestras, and the players are, way more diverse than any than most orchestras we see here in the states so that's very interesting to us um, and that kind of leads into what um, we'll be doing with the film moving forward after our um, our theatrical screening is over okay so and that's my Marcia, cue. you're taking that up right yes here. so so ken ken and i are really committed to do, to um having our films work on the ground. You know, we love that they're in film festivals. We love that they're broadcast. We love that, you know, but also, you know, what, what's the work they can do? And, and with this particular film, um, there's a, a wonderful conversation long overdue in this country about who has access to classical music, who plays it, what's the canon, what's considered music you would play and who's in the audience. And uh, there's some fantastic organizations that are working in this space. Pretty much every musical uh, institution is asking themselves this question about, you know, why are there, I think, what, two and a half percent of the of orchestras are people of color, not, I shouldn't say black and brown people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, are, so, so there's, you know, why is that? And so there, there's organizations that are working to give uh, young kids who have talent access to uh, good instruction and organizations that are working to help uh, talented, you know, older musicians to get really to be prepared for their auditions, mm. all that kind of stuff. And, and our story is interesting because it's not really about that exactly. Um, but what we've seen this a bunch in the screenings, kind of community screenings we've had for, for kids to, um, to see musicians who look like them play at that mm -hmm. level and be respected for that, it opens a door. I mean, you, you see a little bit of that in the film with that uh, the um, uh, arts uh, high school in Detroit. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at those kids, they're mesmerized by these guys. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's an opportunity there. And, and so we are aligning ourselves with these organizations and really trying to create opportunities to have that conversation using, um, using the film. And that's been super satisfying work and um, hanging out in the world of, of musicians and conductors and it's very fun. It's more fun know. than hanging out with, with uh, film funders. <laughs> I bet it is. I bet it is. <laughs> no offense, of course. Intended, I, I, I get it. So uh, do you propose to go in and show this film in schools? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, to, for us to show it or for their music teacher to show it. 
I mean, yes. uh, some uh, we've been on some wonderful in the virtual space. We've been able to be on uh, do Q and A's kind of all over the place. Um, but not they don't necessarily need us. I mean, we, we love to be there. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, we have a curriculum and we're going to build out our website so that it's really a tool for educators. And um, so, yes, I mean, I we would love for um, <laughs> for it to be used in, in schools and community centers and after school music programs and by the symphony and the chamber um, society, et cetera. I mean, there's just, there's so many opportunities and at the university level to have these kind of intersectional conversations about Mm -hmm. the politics and the music and the origin of the music um, Mm -hmm. and what other music is going on in the classical space that we don't know about here. So there's, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Is this the first time that you've ever used one of your films in that way? Uh, as an educational tool, or not at all. Done as well? No, uh, it's it's a uh, it, it's it's a commitment we have. Mm-hmm. So we do that with almost all of our films. Mm-hmm. That's marvelous. That's really marvelous. Uh, last night I saw um, the uh, the opera um, "Fire Shut Up in My Bones," oh. and uh, this young man that plays Charles Blow. Uh, at an early age, he's a young black boy from Harlem, and he's 13 years old. And um, it's for I, I I resonate with what you're saying because you know uh, people of color have not been uh, on the stage taking lead roles like this. And when they see young children coming up, whether they're musicians, actors, uh, singers, or whatever, it's just such encouragement to know that they can do it too. So I really applaud you for that. It's it's a well, you know that they're welcome. And mm-hmm. April, you probably know that that opera, that Terrence Blanchard opera that you saw, was the first opera ever in the Mets' 150 years that was um, composed on by African American yes. by a non-white person, right? Yes. So we, we there's work, there's, day. there's work to do. You know, there but is. what's what's interesting is that there's a whole website about. Uh, uh, about African American composers, uh, which I I had no idea. There's a long, long history. There are many, many of them. Yes. Um, and uh, it's like, okay, why why don't we know about them? And just like we don't know about many famous uh, women composers uh, and musicians, uh, it's been the white male that has dominated society, and that's. That's our history. Uh, we've written history in that way. So it's we're making changes. They're little by little. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, sometimes when we're discouraged and we see just the slightest possibility of a glimmer of light, it's um, it's a breath of fresh air and and hope to keep on working. Well, and I because think the conversation is different now. I mean, I really feel that there is a kind of reckoning happening that that hasn't happened before. Mm-hmm. People are asking those questions mm-hmm. as hard as they are. Yeah. Yes. Ken, did you start to say something? Um, no, I think I, I think that just that we, because there's already people doing this work in the world, like Marcia mentioned, the Sphinx organization in Detroit and El Sistema coming out of the inspired by the system in the Venezuela. And yes. uh, you know, conductor Dudamel in LA, and there's a uh, uh, several African American conductors now in the country, because there's already this work being done. If our film could be a useful tool for them, that would be perfect. You know, we don't have to. We are not the activists, <laughs> but <laughs> but if we could, you know, give materials to the activists to further their work, then that would be a, tr- a tremendous outcome for the film. So this is a huge project to set uh, to set out to get this educational uh, tool in the world. Are you working on any other films right now, or is that kind of on hold? Well, you go first. Uh, I'm always editing somebody's film, either our own or somebody else's. So I am editing a film now um, for a wonderful producer director, and it's about the scourge of of um, murders in in African American, in African America, basically. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. And, and Marcia? Uh, yeah, so I am I'm kind of doing a juggling act now. Um, 
I'm launching this impact campaign with this film. I have a short film that's um, that just launched on OpDocs on the New York Times. And, um, and I now am directing filmmaker services for the Jewish Film Institute. So I'm, uh, I, uh, I have a very full plate. We have some ideas we're percolating that um, might turn into films. Um, but I think right now we're kind of doing these other things and catching our breath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Ken and Marsha, I want to thank you both uh, for talking with us this evening. And um, I, I can't tell you enough about how uh, we appreciate the work that you've done and that you continue to do. I, I just have a great appreciation, especially for this being used as an educational tool and encouragement uh, to young people. Th th thank so you for that. You. And, and, and just, and thank you for the honor of, of, of winning the award. That's very special for us. And I just want to mention to people who might want to hear more music or, or, or own this music that we have a fantastic listen page on the film's website, um, where you can listen to a lot of music, their music, their dad's music, uh, Aldo's wife's music, um, and, and, and there's links to their uh, actual CDs that people can own, including uh, one called Hermanos that has a lot of the music that's in the film. And also, if we have educators that are watching this film and they want to get more information about using this as a tool, what is your website and how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so um, uh, our website is uh, Hermanos Brothers Film. Dot info, but if you just Google Los Hermanos the Brothers with the slash, um, you'll get to our site and there's a contact uh, place there. And uh, we have an educational distributor. Um, it's called Good Docs, and they can also go through them directly, um, and they they can work out an arrangement for them to use the film. Very good. Well, again, yeah. thank you, and we wish you the best uh, with the promotion of this film and and other works that you're doing. Thank, yeah, you, thank you so much, thank April. You, April. Really appreciate that. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.